Welcome to St. Giles Presbyterian Church. We are a caring community of faith in the heart of the Glebe. My name is Paul Wu. I'm a minister of the congregation. I'll be leading worship this morning. Our regular um, vocalist, Katie, is under the weather. So she's not here with us, uh, well, uh, in person. She may be joining uh, from Zoom. Uh, I don't know, but if she is, uh, we, we make sure we need to sing louder. Uh, so if you want music today, you have to make it yourself. Uh, and, and I'm sure that we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. Uh, we are planning a Good Friday service jointly uh, with Baitang Community Church. Uh, it is uh, March 29th. Uh, on, um, at 11 o'clock in the morning. So from 11 to 12, that's our Good Friday service. Uh, Friday, March 29th. Uh, be sure to uh, set apart that time and, and join our service. I'd like to acknowledge that the territory on which we gather and worship is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin people has been living here since time immemorial, and we are honored we can gather and worship on this land. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. It's printed in the bulletin. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God gathers people from the east and the west, from north and south. We will thank God for such all-embracing love. Let us praise God for all God's wonderful works. We will worship God and tell of God's deeds with songs of praise. Let us sing hymn 314, God is love, Come heaven adoring.
Good morning. Um, I'm going to tell you a story today. It's a very strange story from the Bible. And it's recorded in Numbers 21. And in your Sunday school, uh, you may have a chance to look at it a little bit. And the um, story is about Nahust. It's a Hebrew word for a bronze statue, a bronze serpent, statue of a serpent made of bronze. It's um, put on top of a pole. And it was lifted up during the time it was made by Moses. And it was lifted up during that time of, of that 40 years of wandering in the desert. It's a very strange story because this statue of brown serpent uh, turned out to be a symbol of salvation for the Israelite. Now the Israelite, they were wandering in, in the wilderness and for 40 years, and um, they were number of stories, repeat the story of their complaint. They complained about not having food, they complain about not having water. And in this time, as usual, they complain to Moses. And this time they say, well, not only we don't have food and water, we're sick and tired of the food that you're providing with us. So the food that not Moses, God provided them was manna. And this manna was a gift from God from heaven. And it was, it was it sustained the entire community for 40 years in the desert. And, but imagine that if you have to eat the same thing for 40 years. Don't think you'll be, pretty, you'll be happy about that. So it's kind of understandable that the Israelite complain. And, and they have done it before and they're doing it again. But this time God got angry. So instead of providing something else like, you know, I don't know, fried chicken for them. Um, God sent snakes. Snakes slither all around the community and was biting people left and right at random. And so everyone were, were, were afflicted. So the Israelite begged Moses and said, pray to God so that you know, the snake would leave us. But Moses, under God's instruction, uh, made this Houston, this bronze pole, a, a, a bronze statue, a snake of a statue made of bronze lifted on the pole. And the instruction was that look up to the statue and you will live. So the Israelite did. They look up to the bronze uh, snake and, 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 uh, and the actual snakes uh, that were biting them all left. And it, it was a very strange story. And this is the thing about the Bible, um, that this story, uh, it, not only was it odd, uh, but about what happened following. Because, see, God clearly instructed the Israelite not to made any statues, not to bow down to it, not to worship it. But the Israelite, they kept that pole, Nahushtan, they call it, and they kept it for a thousand years. It was kept in the temple of the Lord, and it wasn't until King Hezekiah, uh, in the time of Hezekiah, so that's a thousand years afterwards, that finally that statue was taken apart broken down, uh, but it, it became something that, uh, that a stumbling block to the community of the Israelite for a thousand years. So it was a very, very odd story of why God did that. And, and the story that really, you know, probably should have been forgotten. Uh, it's not the best day for the Israelite, it's certainly not the best day for God. But except for Jesus, who 
raised it, raised up the story. And later on in your Sunday school, your teacher is going to tell you about the context of why Jesus used it. But just remember that just as the pole, this bronze statue was raised, so will Jesus Christ be raised on the pole. And, and it's a kind of a foreshadowing uh, what would happen to Jesus on the cross. So I won't tell you everything, otherwise your Sunday school teacher will have nothing else to say. But remember that, um, uh, that when we say that God sent Jesus to the world, just remember one thing, it is not to condemn us. Yes, we are all sinful, we all make mistakes, and, and you know, we all fall short of the glory of God. But God sent Jesus to us not to condemn us, but to save us from our own mistake, our own sinfulness. So just keep that in mind in your Sunday school. Okay? Let us pray. Father God, I just want to praise you for even sometimes in stories we don't fully understand, in your action we don't fully comprehend, but we trust that it is by your love that you sent your son to us. Teach us once again what it means to look up to Jesus. Teach us once again what it means to repent from our own sinfulness. In the name of, in name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Please join me in this prayer of adoration and later the unison prayer of confession and the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, great and wonderful are your works. Your steadfast love is everlasting. Where there is darkness, you bring light. Where there is sadness, you speak words of hope. Where there is despair, you open new possibilities. You have come among us in Christ Jesus to save us, bringing healing for the sick and forgiveness for the sinners. In this time of worship, stir us with your spirit, O God. Awaken our joy and reverence in our songs and our silence, in our prayers and praises, for you are our God, here and everywhere, now and always. Prayer continues in this prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we often take your acceptance of us for granted. We are careless in our relationships, focus on our own needs and desires. The news distracts us when we put opinion above your expectation of us. Forgive us. Renew our understanding of your purposes and our place within them so we may serve you more faithfully day by day. Our prayer concludes with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and glory forever.
friends in Christ. By grace we have been saved through faith. This is not our doing, but God's gift to us. Know that God forgives you and forgive one another. So may the peace of Christ be with you. Scripture reading from uh, the first passage from Numbers chapter 21 and uh, the, uh, the context, as, as I explained, uh, was uh, in the midst of a complaint by the Israelite. Usual complaint, but unusual reaction from God uh, and offering a truly unique solution to their problem. Uh, the second reading is in John chapter 3, uh, verse 14 to 21. Uh, and the context of that passage was uh, the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, uh, a, a well-known and well-respected rabbi. Uh, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Uh, and uh, this passage uh, covers the second part of the conversation. And Chrissy will lead us in uh, these readings. Good morning. Uh, first reading comes from Numbers 21, uh, verses 4 to 9. From Mount Mount Hall, they set up by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became discouraged on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they beat the people so that many Israels died. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against <clears throat> the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent and set it on, on, on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Today's psalm um, <clears throat> is 107, one to three, and then 17 to 22 with refrain one. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those redeemed from the trouble and gather in from the land, from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction, they loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then in their trouble they cried to the Lord, who saved them from their distress. The Lord sent out a word and healed them, 
and deliver them from destruction. Let them thank for the Lord's steadfast love and God's wonderful works to humankind. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices <coughs> and tell of God's deeds with songs of joy. Well, spring source of life eternal, drench our dryness, make us whole. The second reading comes from the book of John 3, verses 14 to 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For those who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true to come, to come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us now sing hymn 190, You Thirsty One.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A total solar eclipse is coming our way. In about a month on March 8, 2024, a spectacular and a rare celestial event is about to unfold over parts of Canada and the United States. As the moon aligns somehow perfectly between the earth and the sun, and that in itself is a uh, cosmic coincidence, uh, quite a lucky coincidence, a temporary darkness will sweep across parts of North America. I've looked it up. The so-called path of totality uh, will come close to Ottawa, but not quite. We'll get to see partial eclipse uh, here in the nation's capital, but if you want to see and to experience that totality, uh, where the moon covers perfectly the surface of the sun, you'll need to travel on April the 8th. Not too far, though. You can go to Belleville in Ontario at 3.21 p.m. or to Montreal in Quebec at 3.26 p.m. Take your pick. I still recall the last time when a total solar eclipse uh, swept across North America uh, in 2017. Took my family, Daisy, Justin, and Neil uh, on a family trip, packed, four of us packed in a small Mini Cooper and drove 17 hours nonstop down to Nashville, Tennessee, just to witness uh, that experience of a lifetime. It was a rough yet memorable road trip. We had to leave immediately after a Sunday worship service because uh, the total eclipse happens on Monday. I was sick and nursing a cold. So, was my, so were my two boys. The car broke down near... Uh, about an hour out of Montreal, uh, and somehow we managed to got it uh, to a garage. I think it was a Canadian tire, I'm not so sure. Uh, found out the problem was a burned fuse. We switched that out and resumed our journey. We tried to, on the way, uh, to get our hands on uh, specially designed uh, uh, um, UV blocking sunglasses, but to no avail, and because they were all sold out, we didn't prepare ahead of time. So we had to make crew substitutes uh, with, uh, well, a, a pin, a, a box pinhole projector. That's what they call it, if you believe it, out of cereal boxes. So this is what you do: you 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 cut out a small opening on one side of the box, you put aluminum foil uh, on it, and you drill a pinhole through the foil, uh, which allows the sunlight to come through and project onto the other side of the box, inside the box. Uh, so this way, you can see the eclipsing sound, sun uh, safely and without staring at the sun with your naked eyes. Uh, the whole thing was very MacGyver-ish, and, and I was rather proud of that. We made it to Nashville just in time and drove to an elevated platform, uh, I think halfway up a mountain, up, up a hill. Uh, we weren't alone, of course. Uh, we were uh, one among many uh, in the midst of an excited, cheering crowd. And we waited for the moon to metaphorically eat into the sun. When that moment came, 
It was spectacular. Bright sky gave way to a creeping darkness. The ambient light changed. The air got colder, and the moon slow glided into place. All around us, it went silent. People, birds, even insects, stopped. Their busy chirping froze, and look up. The brilliant beams of light around the sun shimmered and disappeared one by one until there was nothing left but that dancing glow of sun's corona. It was a spectacular view. Did I say that already? A perfect blend of light and darkness held together, however briefly, in perfect harmony. Was it a life-changing experience? Not really, but that view of that glow, a glowing circle of light. In the midst of complete darkness,、uh, that view did leave a lasting impression. It made me wonder what it was like when God called forth light out of darkness in Genesis chapter one, verse three to four. Then God said, "Let there be light," and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. This duality of light and darkness, this theme is picked up by Saint John in the opening chapter of his gospel, chapter one,、uh, as in verse four to five. In Him was life. Him speaking about Jesus. In the life was the light. Of all people, the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. And jumping a little bit ahead to verse nine, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Announced quite hopefully by both John the Baptizer and John the Evangelist. Saint Augustine, the early church father, in his commentary on Genesis, reflected on the theology of light and of vision. He noted that light was the first creature made out of nothing. As the first incarnation of God's word, light is the supreme example of God's beauty. And form, for God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness. Moreover, since light is incorporeal, it is the most spiritual of all creature, said Augustine. And since light is not only incorporeal but also visible, it is the ultimate. Mediator between the visible and the invisible, the material and the immaterial. Saint Saint Augustine also noted elsewhere, I believe, in his confession, that it is no advantage to be near the light if the eyes are closed. And doubtly. A commentary on the state of sinfulness of humanity. As John the Evangelist also noted、uh, in our scripture reading today, in John three chapter three verse nineteen, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
The tone and the content certainly was judgmental, and no escaping that. But it's worth noting. It's worth noting this ultimate mediator, whom Augustine speaks of, is no none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world as true light shining into a darkened world. Christ is a gift. Of God for us, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. John chapter three verse sixteen. It is one of the best known, best loved verse in the Bible. Proclaiming God's extravagant love for the world, seeing through that singular act of self-giving grace. Furthermore, John's gospel assures us that God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. The key here is faith. Yet it needs and it seeks understanding. In the Reformed tradition, particularly of Calvinism, that's neatly summed up by、uh, this improbable acronym, T U L I P, Tulip. Stands for total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saint. By such understanding, human beings are utterly incapable of truly loving God and neighbors, for all have been corrupted by sin. Original, personal, or systematic. We cannot overcome our own depravity, our incapacity, and our enslavement to sin, except and only through Christ. Only Christ can atone for our sin and bring about meaningful and lasting reconciliation between God and people. And between people and people, but since not all people are reconciled, living in God's grace of faith, hope, and love, it stands to reason that the atoning sacrifice of Christ must be limited to those whom God has chosen of God's elect. This is the gift of God, being drawn into the circle of God's grace, and nothing can separate them from the love of God that is in Christ. That's Calvinism. However, within the Reformed tradition, there exists another understanding, the so-called Arminianism, and holds that. God's gracious love for creation extends to all. All people can receive this gift of salvation. Nevertheless, individuals can and must choose to accept God's grace by faith. That is believing Jesus Christ as Savior and believing in. Christ's atoning death, His resur- resurrection, and His glorification. Alternatively, individuals can also refuse to believe, refusing salvation through faithless neglect or active disobedience. 
in the sense that the opposite of faith is not unfaith, but disobedience and outright rebellion. That's Armenianism. Now, these descriptions are, of course, caricatures, failing to do justice to both John Calvin or Jacob Arminius. Yet, they illustrate this possible polar opposite of faith and grace, of sola fide and sola gratia, by faith alone or by grace alone. If salvation comes by grace alone, is faith redundant? On the other hand, if salvation comes through faith alone, is grace superfluous? Or put it in a more personal way, is my salvation dependent upon the steadfastness of my faith or on the overwhelmingness of God's grace. It's a hard theological question that scholars and theologians have been debating for quite some time. In my humble opinion, it is neither and it is both. The relationship between grace and faith is a mystery. Not in the sense of it's too hard to explain, so I won't even try. But in the sense of the dynamic tension held between these two poles, neither giving in to one another, neither making sense without the other. As author and theologian Joseph D. Small explains, Mystery is not an excuse for a lack of understanding, but a journey into understanding that leads ever deeper into the fullness of comprehension and appreciation. With mystery, the more we know, the more we realize that there is more to be known. Faith and grace, light and darkness, to condemn and to save. It is worth reminding ourselves that central to this passage of John chapter 3 is in verse 16, more specifically, the first part, of John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It was, after all, divine love that stirred God's heart at the cries of a group of slaves in Egypt. It was love that God bestowed upon that group of slaves call them Israel, and bestow upon them both the law and the promised land. It was love that God raised up prophets to declare to them of God's desire for compassion and for justice, of God's preferential care for widows, orphans, and sojourners. It was divine love that sent Jesus, the Son of God, to be incarnated in the world. It was love that Jesus taught us to love, not only those who look and think like us, but to love even our enemies. It was love that inspired the early church to open doors 
of communion and of fellowship, not only with the Jews but also Gentiles, not only to those deemed worthy but also those on the margin of society. It was love. It is love that still compels the church, compels us to proclaim Christ. That the light of the world has come. The light that saves, not condemns. So embrace this light, not run away from it. You can stare at it, if you like. It won't blind you. Rather, the light of the world will truly open your eye. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this prayers of the people, I invite you to join me responsively. So, when you hear the prompt, "God in Your mercy," respond. Hear our prayer. God, in Your mercy, let us pray. Gracious God, You have called together a people to be the Church of Jesus Christ. Keep our minds and hearts upon open to Your Word and Your ways, so that the world. May see in us compassion and wisdom in action. May our lives lead others to believe in your love and in your light. God, in your mercy, Creator God, you made all things and call them good. Thank you for the wonders of the world that surround us, and the promise of new life stirring in, bur- in burrows and seed beds around us. We pray for the earth in its vulnerability, staggering under the demands of human needs and expectations. May your planet Earth be held in reverence by all people. To use its resources wisely and respect its fragile balance between life and death. O、oh、God, in Your mercy, Christ, Prince of Peace, Light of the World. Thank you for Your commitment to mercy and forgiveness, which overcome our desire for revenge. Speak to the hearts of people everywhere, and to those who occupy places of power and influence in every land. Teach us how to seek peace on earth together. Especially this week, we remember that regions in conflict in Ukraine, in Gaza. In Yemen and in Haiti, and pray that a just resolution to conflict will soon prevail for the sake of the vulnerable. Overcome the fear, greed, violence, or vanity that turn neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. May all who claim your name be known as makers of peace. O、oh、God, in your mercy, our prayer. Christ, healer of hearts and hopes, you desire health and wholeness for each one of us. Thank you for times of well-being. 
whether measured in minutes or months. We pray that lives caught up in economic pressure of these times may find enough to sustain them day by day and hope for more generous future. Grant rest and renewal to all who are broken in body or spirit and bring comfort to those who ache with loss or anxiety. In this time of silence, we lift up before you those that are in our hearts today. O oh God, in your mercy. Holy Spirit, source of wisdom and courage, embrace your church with hope this day that we may live faithfully, encouraging each other by the commitment we have witnessed in Jesus Christ, in whose name we offer this prayer. Amen. Let us now sing him 776, Jesus, Life of All the World.
Let us take this time to greet each other in uh, the peace of Christ. And we'll do so by first uh, recognizing those who are joining from teleconference. Jane Evans. Hi, Jane. Hi. Good to hear from you. We're having rain mixed with snow. That's right. We're having lots of rain. Let me acknowledge those who are here, uh, uh, who are joining from Zoom. I see Bill. Hi, Bill. I see Jeff. Good morning. Peace of Christ be with everyone. Peace of Christ be with you. I see Dorothy and Kate. Hi, Paul. Good morning. Good morning to both of you. Let me uh, acknowledge people, those who are here uh, in person. Uh, I almost said Katie, but. <coughs> um, Heather, uh, our music director, thank you. Uh, Jean and Stan. And Pauline, come as I see Miriam and Chrissy, our scripture reader today. Thank you. I see Nick and our duty elder, Laura. Uh, those providing technical support, Stu and Rob. I see Dong, Kay, Kathy. Good to see you. Nora. Nelson, Bonaventure. Peace of the Lord be with each and every one of you. And, with, and also, with you. also with you. Hello. Um, there are a lot of announce announcements in your um, bulletin, all the regular ones, and uh, the instructions for joining um, the uh, conference calls. Um, I'd like to mention the uh, film event on March the 16th, which is the second announcement um, with any detail in your um, bulletins. I also want to mention two things. I'm carrying food, and the reason I've, I'm bringing attention to this is the food bank has had to add more sessions to its um, programming because the demand for food from people who cannot afford to buy it due to the pressures of increasing costs particularly rental, um, mean that the, um, the demand has to be supplemented as much as we can do it. So I encourage everybody to either donate packaged canned food that um, is intact and can't be um, you know, opened or anything like that, or just um, give checks. Um, you can put them on the plate or you can donate online and uh, that will help immensely to deal with this very human crisis that we have in our own city. Lots of things to show. The second thing is that um, the next uh, sanctuary art exhibition is going to be made by you. And um, probably if we're lucky, all the other congregations that meet here and we're going to make a series of joyous crosses 
that will hang on the walls between the stained glass windows. Um, they're extremely easy to make. Um, recycled wood, recycled gift cards, Christmas cards, thank you cards. Um, my grandson made eight crosses and they are downstairs in the book nook, as are the chopped up bits of card which I chopped up while driving to Montreal. <laughs> uh, I not, don't believe in wasting time. And the artistry comes to how you put your bits of card on the cross and whether you cut it down or do crisscrossy bits or do whatever you want. It's just glue and sticking. And anybody can do it. You can work together. You can do your own thing. Uh, everything's downstairs and we'll try and get them up by um, Easter Sunday. So uh, please have fun because we may do this kind of thing again because it's our sanctuary. So we should be celebrating it um, as much as we can through the skill in our hands, our minds, and our thoughts. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nora, for that wonderful idea. Uh, she's going to make an artist out of all of us. So. And please don't, don't think that it's only for the Sunday school. It's for all of you. Uh, and, and I expect you to be creative and just have fun with it. Um, as the uh, offering will be collected shortly, we're reminded that uh, we are in the season of Lent. Uh, and this season of Lent, leads us closer and closer to the cross. So as we contemplate on uh, Jesus lifted up uh, on the cross for our sake, uh, consider what the gift of his mercy and grace means for you. And let us, that our offering uh, express our thanksgiving uh, to such an amazing gift from God. Please rise and let us uh, sing the doxology. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you gave so much without counting the cost. Bless these gifts with your generous love. Use them to bless the world with the same hope and healing we have found in you. And let us not count the cost until we too have given all that we can for your sake. Amen. Let us sing our closing hymn, 643, Lift High the Cross.
Go now in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you from this day and forever.